Bonjour and uh, good evening everyone. <clears throat> this is Chrome, the French Terran. Uh, welcome to this first video where we're going to do some uh, strategic uh, analysis. And uh, today's topic is going to be about the importance of uh, positioning and uh, having a good position. So when you consider positioning, uh, you probably have heard already some stuff when you did play StarCraft 2, uh, such as, uh, okay, I want to put myself into a good position, I want to flank his army very good, or I want to put him back or to contain him. All these concepts, uh, even the concept of uh, dropping or taking an expansion or moving your army, all this stuff are related to uh, positioning. The first question you should ask probably is why being concerned about positioning when you play StarCraft 2? Because uh, probably if you are like a bronze or a silver player and you think, uh, why should I care about positioning? Because so far I have to improve my macro, I have to improve my micro, my A, my h one with my marines. I have to think about producing SCV, producing supply, that kind of stuff. So why being concerned about this? Because there is already a lot of things to think about. And the answer is uh, that positioning is one of the best way to win a game because if you are into a bad position if you're taking a bad fight or if you completely uh, out of range of your enemy's army and you lose all your buildings pretty silly in a silly way uh, you will understand that positioning truly matter of course there are other stuff such as the tech choice or the timing or um, having a, having a, multi a good multitasking, having a good micro. But today, we're going to focus on the importance uh, of uh, having a good position, right? So what does it mean, having a good position? I've been saying a lot of stuff about drops, uh, about uh, being uh, aware of your enemy's army, uh, but in details, what does it mean? Positioning. There is a lot of things behind this concept. So first, first of all, for me, positioning means being prepared to your opponent's uh, movements. By that, I mean that uh, if you know where your opponent is, and if you uh, and if you're completely out of position, uh, you you can lose quite badly unless you you figure out he is coming, and therefore you can move your army. Uh, so if you are very skillful into the positioning, you will always prepare about where your opponent is, is doing. And that's why sometimes uh, you see a pro gamer doing a lot of scan or for offering a lot of overseer uh, on their enemy to always know where your opponent is me. Yes. In regards to the second concept, having a good awareness of the map, and uh, to, pre to be prepared to what your opponent is going to do, you have to always know um, where, he, where he is, does he have to expand, where his army is, is he planning a drop or something like that. And a good player in StarCraft 2 is always uh, aware of the importance of having a good map control, of always scanning your army. But here we're not talking only about scanning, uh, scanning your, uh, your opponent's tech or uh, be aware of what if drops are coming, but more generally knowing what's going on in the map, if you can move forward, if you have to go back, that kind of thing. Uh, then positioning can increase your chance of winning the fight, because uh, I, I will use the example of a choke. Choke is also related to positioning. If you are on the top of the choke and your opponent is very ba a bad place, uh, it can take quite a, a lot of damage, and this is also the importance of the concave. So if you are into a good concave, you will increase your chance of winning. You see that a lot, like in ZVZ, uh, if you are Roach versus Roach, so players who are the best concave will always win. So um, if you take your opponent off the position, or if you flank him, if you're having a better concave, all this stuff related to positioning can increase your chance of winning a fight and ultimately winning the game. And finally, uh, if you are into a good position, uh, if you are well placed uh, on the map, uh, and you're able to put some pressure on your army, on your opponent's army, uh, by some kind of pressure, by some kind of drops, that kind of things, uh, it allows you also to be safe, because as long as you're into uh, a very 
good position, if you're putting some some contain, you'll be able to expand more safely. All right. So on this map, on a, uh, this is a very classic map of the ladder, right? And I just I just want to show you some example of what getting into in, into a good position mean. So um, a very bad position, uh, if you assume that you are on B1, B2, and B3, will be obviously to have your army around it here, because uh, it it's pointless. It doesn't defend anything, and your opponents can quite easily get into your B2, your B1, or doing some drops right here, and your army will take a very long time to go back. But this is uh, I think this is kind of obvious for all players that your army should not be somewhere where uh, there is no utility, right? So this first concept uh, it emphasizes the importance of having a good position. Now, okay, uh, second example. So if I have a B2 and a B3 here, and I'm taking the map control uh, on the Xernaga here, it gives me a lot of control over this area. So I do protect myself for any attack from this location or this location. But uh, it doesn't give me vision on this spot, and an enemy can quite easily sneak into this spot or doing a drop over this uh, location. So on Oana, it's not always a good idea to put all your army on the center of the map to the Xenagator, because you're still vulnerable to some uh, attack that your opponents may do. But uh, if you are quite an economic, you can put some turrets right here to defend yourself, and the, putting some ar army here, like some kind of tanks or, or a little bit of, of bubble. Or third, uh, a third option, you can put a, um, a sun tower here or some kind of army here, just something to scout and to control therefore this area of the map. So if I put like say an overload or a building right here uh, and a building right here, so I, I am aware of everything I can going on and therefore this position, which was bad at the beginning, uh, becomes good, right? So. Now we're going to look uh, at some some game because this is what we want so far, right? So uh, th this game is going to be between Supernova and 4GG, and both players are going into mech. So mech is made of aliens, tank, and Viking to get some uh, some map control and sometimes Thor to break the line, right? Um, so on this uh, on this game, we, we see that uh, nothing did happen. We are on 12 minute mark. Uh, there are, has been no loss so far, and uh, this game really shows the importance of having a good position. Um, so FTG is going for a push, so he's having quite a lot of tanks, a lot of aliens, and he wants to get into this location to put some pressure on his opponent and prevent him from expanding while he is able to expand himself. Uh, but Supernova is quite aware of what's going on. If we look into his vision, uh, thanks to the racks and the Xenagator, you know that something is coming. So as a reaction, he decided to to use his aliens to, to cut the push. Now you do consider that uh, Supernova is putting some defense here, because he knows that his opponent is coming, and he's, he's using his aliens to force his opponent to go back. This is a very good move, because uh, while it doesn't do a lot of damage so far, but it forces the opponent to go back, and therefore it allows him to, uh, to ex take an expansion by himself, and to, to get into a better position than this one. So, at this location, you not you defending only two bases. While if you are the Xenaga Tower, you are able to defend three expansion instead of two, which is better. Plus, thanks to the rack, he is able to see any attack from the north, and uh, and uh, thanks to the Xenaga Tower, he can control anything that's going on on the south. So far, uh, Supernova's position is quite good. He's even sending an alien. This is something very important to send some units to be to be prepared to what any kind of attack was coming. So the tanks and the aliens are coming. So Supernova, uh, instead of uh, staying here and the south, move a little bit to the north to facilitate his defense on his third base, and he's also taking a ninja expand at the top. 
Uh, this point is very important. If you know that your opponent is going to attack you or would try to inflict you some, some damage or try to contain you on two bases, um, your reaction should be to try to take any kind of advantage. Advantage can mean uh, doing a drop to distract your opponent or doing a run by of onions as Supernova did uh, a few, few minutes ago by doing a run by here and then forcing his opponent army to go back then taking a better position, right? Or you can take Aryan superiority like um, Supernova is doing and therefore, uh, thanks to his better account of Vikings, it forces the army to go back. So this move uh, put all the army of 4GG to go back because he, w he wants to defend himself against the Vikings even even if it's kind of excessive to send all your tank back in, in this location and this allow Supernova to take the middle of the map uh, so Su Supernova is now switching from uh, a defensive position at Zenlagato to an offensive position and what he say to this position also apply to this position uh, it means that you can easily uh, control any movement from the top of um, of its location or from the south as well. And now, uh, all, every, uh, all of that supernova supernova is needed right now is uh, sensor tower to really control all the map because uh, uh, the Zuglanaga tower does not have enough vision to control what's going on in the south. Now it's slightly better. And uh, 4GG on the other end to break his contain can only go to the south because this is the only location which is quite unscouted. But uh, Spanova is quite aware of this weak point, so instead of getting into a direct fight with uh, 4GG, he only has to do to move his army to this location. Now imagine that if 4GG uh, would have moved to this location and Spanova did not have the sensor tower or was not aware of the, this army or didn't have any intel to to know what's going on his army will have slightly and subtly uh, go into this location and then uh, getting into his B2 and B4 and stopping any any um, any troops to, to reinforce uh, Spanova's army so Spanova will have cut it off and, we, and uh, he would have forced the fight and it would have been to the advantage of 4 GG. And finally, for 4GG, uh, Smanova did scout him, so he has to go back and find another uh, opportunity to fight. But now the contain is quite good from Supernova because he's having a, a pretty great line of tank, which prevents any attack, uh, any frontal attack. And 4GG, as you can see, he is trying to find a backdoor to break his uh, opponent. Always do this when you're under contain, find a backdoor, find an opportunity, do a drop or uh, find the weak point to break the contain. So he's breaking the rocks because he's intending to push at this location because he thinks it's the weak point. So you, the, 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 la the line of tanks is quite dispersed. If he's going here, there is like 12 tanks we can attack him quite easily, while in this location there is only 4 plus some aliens. But as you can see, uh, even if army uh, were even uh, at, the, at the beginning, so uh, even slightly favoring Supernova, but not that much, so slightly even, uh, because uh, he's taking a very bad engagement, his army is getting crushed quite fastly and quite easily. And plus, because he moved to the top of the, of the map with all his troops, the south is no longer protected, and this allows Supernova to do some damage to the economy. So if you break a contain, or if someone is breaking you, uh, you contain, you know that all his army is going to be used in this process. And on the other end, this, uh, this le le may put some of your extents under protect. No, no, no protector, sorry. And then you have GG. Right? So this first game did illustrate to uh, Quite, uh, quite, uh, in, uh, quite well uh, the importance of contain and um, the, Im the importance of uh, knowing how to put yourself into a better position than you were. 
All right, so now we are on another game, uh, TVP uh, of, with uh, Empire Sioux versus Empire Beastie. And um, uh, what we are going to do now is uh, watching the positioning, not in a mech versus mech matchup, whereas positioning is quite obvious because you have line of tank versus li another line of tank, but in a more dynamic matchup, so in a Terran versus uh, Protoss. Here, which, which is more important, is not, not, not especially like keeping your army here to control the whole area, but more knowing when to attack and when to defend, and above all, like uh, really, re really be prepared to any any kind of movement your opponent is doing. So Imperial BC is having a pl is plus one plus one prepare. He got his team pack and he's got his are almost ready. So he decided to go for a push and to try to do some damage uh, right now. Uh, remember that if you want to push, always uh, be sure that you have some, time, uh, some kind of advantage to crush your, your enemy. So Empire Sioux uh, is viewing his uh, opponent coming, and uh, finally for Empire Beastie, he does have the tech to counter his push, thanks to the Colossus. So at this point, Empire Beastie, uh, because he did spend a lot of money uh, on, the, on this push, know that uh, he he didn't manage to do any kind of damage. So he, uh, at this point of the game, he has two options. Either he let his opponent counter push with his technologic advantage, so the Colossus, and uh, he's putting himself into a defensive position, or he's trying to inflict some damage with, by uh, taking a risk and trying to, 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 trying to get uh, an advantage by developing a specific tech or uh, taking an expansion or doing a drop. So, Beastie, who still does have a very good control of the map, thanks to the Flying Factory, the Xel Naga, and the Random Marine here, is going to do some kind of drop. But, as you can see, Empire Beastie is expecting this drop. Uh, plus, he's having a very good uh, map control as well, thanks to this uh, Prism over here and this observer over here. So, when you do a drop, always, and, and that nothing did happen into, into, into the game, always keep in mind that um, the drop that you're that you going to do can be quite easily countered. If you're doing only one drop at one location and your opponent's army is, uh, is, uh, has not been crushed or being distracted. Uh, in other words, don't do a uh, useless move. For me, this drop was useless because it didn't have any hidden goal. By hidden goal, I mean, okay, so I do a drop here uh, only to force my opponent's army to go back and then to control the middle of the map and eventually to attack if B3 or B2. Right? But here, uh, or you can use your drops to do another drop here and therefore attra attra uh, attract all your opponent's army to this location, and then you can drop here, and then drop back here, and then drop here. Uh, there, are, there are many possibilities, like to do multi-front, and then keep it your, always your opponent's army with Z. Third, third option, you can still do, do a drop here, then a drop here, and this allows you to take the middle of the map, and eventually to put some pressure and put Empire Beastie on a defensive position. Unfortunately, because the drop did fail, um, uh, this allows Empire of Sioux to move forward. Why? Because uh, he knows that some of his opponent's army has been crushed because of this, and before, and plus, he is having a very good vision on his opponent's uh, army thanks to this observer. Before moving, always be aware where your opponent's army here I I is. And as you can see, Empire of Beastie is not a Xenlaga tower, because he knows that his army is far too weak to defend him. Well, it's not that far too weak, but he, he decided to go on a defensive position, uh, just in case his opponent did attack him. But, again, this, is my, in my opi uh, opinion, is quite tough to deal with, because this allows Empire Sioux to take the, con the middle of the map. And then, uh, and, and then to eventually uh, put some pressure. Plus, Empire Sioux is doing a very interesting thing, which is a war prison. So, you're going to ask me, but Chrome, what, what are you saying? 
you're saying that uh, Empire of the City drop, it was bad, and now Empire of the City drop, and this is good. Yeah, because on this drop, there were no hidden goals. There were nothing behind this. It was just a drop for a drop. And there were no damage inflicted before that, there were no advantage which uh, BST did take, and uh, there were no multi fronts. So it was it was bad drop. On the other hand, a good drop is a drop which allows you to get into a good position. Here, uh, Empire Su can take the middle of the map thanks to his uh, th thanks to his uh, ability to destroy his uh, enemy drop, and thanks to this warp prism, which forced his opponent army to to be distracted uh, at this location. And because Empire Beastie did not have any visibility, any awareness of what his opponent is doing. It did, not, it did lose the control of the Xel Naga, it did lose this, and it didn't do any scans. And he's getting distracted by this war prism. He's going to throw all his Vikings to this location. So this is a bad reaction because he did not have the awareness of the map. And now Empire BC can quite easily crush his opponent army despite the fact that Empire BC did have a lot of Vikings and will eventually uh, lose the game. Okay, so remember when you drop always have something in mind like I drop because I want to get into the middle of the map and get better control and put better pressure on my opponent or I drop because I want me to have a better opportunity to inflict damage on his third base or I drop because I want him to be distracted and then uh, to, get, to earn some time to get a better tech than the one I usually have. If you imagine that, for instance, Empire BC did not have any Vikings and he saw the Colossus, he could, he could do this drop here to gain some time and uh, to get the Vikings and then to counter the Colossus, right? Okay, so now we're into the third game and uh, this is... Uh a game of the Scarlet versus uh, Minigun. Uh, this is a very big macro game and uh, you will notice that even in ZVP when you don't have any tanks or uh, any strong line created by mech units, uh, the positioning is still a very important factor, especially in the long game. Uh, as you can see right now, you have a Minigun's army made of Colossus, Stalker and, and Sentry in the middle of the map and um, is um, Minigun is having quite a good control, map control of the map so far. He's having a, a, a presence for here, uh, observer, his army, and if you consider Scarlet on the other end, she also have very good map control thanks to her creep spread and our overload plate, overload plate. So so far, we can say that the map is pretty much cut in half. And what's going to be determinant is in the next minute if is if. Uh, Minigam is able to put pressure and to get into uh, Scarlet expansion. While well, uh, Scarlet expansion are, are quite good protected, but if he is able to contain her on three bases and five bases, even if a Gunem on five bases may sound a little bit silly, but still, if he managed to push the creep back and to contain her force here, he is able to take more easily his fifth base as well. And uh, why not this six or seven base? But what is important here is uh, how can you get into a very good position by putting your opponent, by containing your opponent into his own base. As you may know, uh, so Scarlet, he, 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 she's going into an Infestor Broodlord composition, and uh, Minigun is quite aware of this, he's going for the Fleet Beacon to counter this with the Consolidate and the uh, Carriers. And uh, you know that Overlords and Infestor are quite slow, right? So this is why uh, Minigun, to, to get himself an advantage, is going to do some, some multi-front. He's getting into, with one, one, one more prism in this position, another one, one prism into this position, and he's forcing uh, Scarlet to go, to go back and defend. Because uh, Overlord's army quite, is quite slow and uh, Scarlet only have some roaches and uh, Infestor to deal with it, uh, it allows uh, Minigun to take control of the middle of the map, to clean the creep at, the, at this location and to, uh, and to take a little bit of advance. 
Scarlet, only with the Overlord, is not, she is not able to counter this, because Overlord will be too exposed. And this allows Minigun to clean all the creep here, thanks to this Observer, and therefore to defend ultimately all this expansion into this position. So, what's, what's, what's very uh, important here is that uh, by warping units, by putting some pressure with your Zealots, by cleaning the creep, you are getting yourself into a better position. Three points are very important. Always hold the line on the middle of the map. Always keep pressure by creating some multi-front. And uh, more important, above all, always keep vision of the map. So, so far, Minigun is doing quite a good job by containing Scarlet into her bases, and uh, thanks to this, his or his own bases are, are completely safe. So, we're going to move a little bit further into the 22 minute mark to see that, uh, despite a very good uh, job that Minigun is doing quite so far, it does not prevent Scarlet to attacking at some point. So this is quite a scary army made of uh, 14 Infestor, 14 Broodlords, and uh, some some character as well. And so far, uh, Minigun does not have the army to deal with this force. So the solution, when you know that your opponent is getting close to your base, you know that you know that this position does not allow him to attack you before and five. So these bases are safe so far, as long as your army is here. And you cannot take this army in a frontal way, because otherwise you know that you will lose quite easily against the Infestor and the Broodlords which are behind. So what Minigun is doing, he will create some kind of diversion by putting his army into attacking uh, Scarlet's one. This forces Scarlet to go back. And this is a very important point. If you create a uh, multi-front, or if you put some pressure or use some diversion strategy, your opponent may react like this, by getting back. And this is important, because as you can see, uh, Minigun does need more carrier and, uh, to deal with uh, Scarlet's army. And plus, he needs to he needs to create multi front as he did before with the War Prism, to have a chance of winning against this very scary force. Uh, so, but but unfortunately, uh, at some point, Minigun go, goes back because of uh, Scarlet forces, and therefore, Innova still does not have enough force to deal with this uh, huge uh, Zerg army. So, instead of taking uh, a quite um, uh, an impossible fight to win, he has to go back. Why? Because if he would stay at this position, he will have the force to take the fight. So he is trying to go back as further as possible and to force Scarlet to go into some kind of a trap. So she is, she, he, Minigum is doing some kind of harass, killing some investor, which is not a big deal. He's getting inside into a defensive position, and then Scarlet has to extend a lot into the before of, uh, Mini, of Minigun. And this position may be some kind of trap, because Minigun can easily attack from the back, and can, uh, and can more easily defend against the force. Scarlet do realize that this position is not favorable to her, because her, her overlord are quite exposed, she doesn't have any entire anymore, and uh, she may lose her army quite easily, so she decided to go back, which is a wise choice. If your opponent is, is into a very defensive position, like this one, like getting very back, as, as of before, instead of, uh, of pushing forward and pushing forward and, until you kill yourself and overextend, you could either just go back and keep defensive, as Scarlet is doing, and, and capitalize on your advantage you have, or try to do some multi-front by attacking the B2, which is not defended, offering some uh, infest infested terrain, uh, and offering some units at the B3. Alright, so now we're going uh, to move at the end of the game. 
So we are on the 32 minutes mark. And as you can see, uh, Scarlett did manage to keep his, uh, her position without getting back to Ferber. So she extended her creep a lot and she is now putting some spine crawler uh, as, as, a, as a door of Minigun. And Scarlett, uh, without taking very important fights, managed to kill uh, Minigun only by containing him. So, again, this is weird to say, but Minigun is, is contained on five bases, and the Zer can do whatever he wants. And despite the fact that overall are a very slow army, there is no way that Minigun can engage into so many spine crawlers, so many infestors, etc. Et and because I didn't show you the game, of course, but because of the rest of the game, it didn't do any more uh, War Prism Arras or more multi front. This allowed uh, Scarlet to to get uh, to get into a pretty good position and maintaining a very good pressure on his opponent. So, okay, you might think by saying this fight, okay, so. Uh, this guy is not winning because of position, but only because of a composition made of a lot of Broodlord investors. And uh, Minigun does not manage to, ki to kill her, and perhaps this is even a little bit Imba. No, this is not Imba or anything. This is just that uh, Minigun did not do uh, an enough deal at putting pressure on Scarlet. And before Scarlet, he managed to push a little bit, a little bit, and then to contain Minigun. And uh, now, all, all Skelet has to do is just wait for Minigun to crush himself, because the only solution for Minigun will be either to put all of his uh, flying forces into this B6 and B5, uh, or just to stay defensive and die, because if if Minigun only controls this part of the map and Skelet the rest of the map, inevitably, he is going to lose. And now, even on five bases, he is now out of mineral, while uh, Scarlet still did, uh, did have a huge bank, and um, and yeah, Minigun is going to lose uh, pretty fast. Right. So what did we learn through this free replays? That positioning could be a very important uh, factor on uh, on StarCraft Two game. Uh, Despite the fact that other factors may play, obviously, such as tech armies and timing and that kind of stuff. But still, positioning is a very important thing. So now, how to improve my positioning skills? Um, you have to consider, first of all, the importance of multifronts. Always create multifronts to distract your opponent and put some pressure. Even if, as uh, Spenova did in the first game, you send 14 aliens and you only kill 5 SCV. It's not a big deal, because it, force, it forces your opponent to go back, it puts some pressure, so he's feeling a little bit scared, he does not dare that much to attack you, not immediately at least, and therefore you can have uh, both a uh, physical advantage by getting better position and a psychological advantage as well. And so always try to distract your opponent and create opportunities to be in a better position. Then, very important for all aspects of the game, improve your vision of the map. So you can you can use scans, you can use overload, you can send SCV. We did see that players were just putting one marine, one alien, one flying barracks, or creating more observers than usual. All of this is very important. Because if you see where your opponent is, therefore you can react appropriately and you can anticipate every any of his movements. So if you want to think into the game, okay, how can I improve my position? Always think by having better uh, knowledge of what your opponent is doing and by having a better vision of the, of the game. Uh, third point, don't let yourself contain, always try to put some pressure. So yeah, we did see that Minigun, at some point, uh, after all his pushes with the War Prism, let himself contain at some point and let Scarlet attack him which was quite bad for him, because he wasn't able to deal with this huge force of brutal lords and infestors. And therefore, he should have kept putting the pressure by creating some multi-front, even by trying some base trade uh, tactics. 
because uh, I do think that versus a very slow army such as Scarlet One, but you cannot deal uh, face to face, you have to try some best trade and you have to kill as many expansion of the deck as possible and always use multi front even if you are a pro, right? So always try to to put some pressure on your opponent. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> This is very important because this is through this kind of mean that you will be able to win some game. And finally, uh, don't excite too much. Don't overextend. Don't think, okay, I did add some advantage. I did uh, add, a, uh, added success into my drop, so I'm going to crush him in the face right now and attack directly to his expansion. No, don't 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 over overreact. Uh, always keep your vision of the game. Always try to see where your opponent's army is and place appropriately uh, compared to him. Like, uh, if you're getting too fast into your positioning, if you want uh, having a good position on the map, despite being safe, this is bad for you, right? So always be sure when you, when you, um, when you expand your position that you're not susceptible to suffer from some drops or from some run-by, that your defenses are good, and therefore, then you can be into a more aggressive position. So finally, be patient and calm. There is no need to hurry to get into a good position. Always have a good control of your units. And remember that uh, for being safe, you always need to be aware of everything, what's going on. Okay, so that's all for the video. Uh, thank you for watching me, guys. I hope you did enjoy it. Don't hesitate to put some comments and, or to give your opinion on what you think on this first video. There are going to be uh, more videos about strategic analysis. And next time, I think we are going to look at the, import uh, the, uh, the importance of tech choices, how to interpret tech choices, and how to make tech choices. Right? So I'm looking forward to this, guys. And uh, thank you again. And see you. Bye-bye.